All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are back for another Boca podcast episode. Despite various technical difficulties, actually, I was just telling our, our guest over the last month or so, for whatever reason, there have been some tech issues, especially with connectivity, and we're, we're crossing our fingers for this one. Hopefully, we can make it through. Thanks for your patience. Uh, for those of you that may be streaming with us live today, please don't hesitate to jump into the conversation, ask a lot of questions. I've got not only a really interesting, but super talented guest on the show today, Robert Hill is going to be with me. And uh, so don't hesitate to ask questions as we're digging into this topic about how to create emotionally evocative images. One of the benefits of the live stream is being able to ask questions. Don't be shy. Uh, for those of you that are listening to the audio after the fact, make sure to come join us. You can go to youtube.com slash Boca, B-O-K-E-H podcast, click subscribe, turn on notifications and keep up to date with the upcoming live streams. So do that and come hang out with us next time. We've got another live stream coming up later this week as well. And then one last note, uh, as I promised you all I would do every episode, I, I made a donation before the episode to Charity Water. This is an organization that uh, I've been donating to for a little bit. Uh, I just popped the receipt up there on the screen for those of you that are live, screen, or live streaming. But I just do this as an encouragement and a reminder to you all, and a bit of accountability on my part too, um, after my episode with Sean Lee a number of months ago, to just look for opportunities to give back. And it's amazing how even just a little bit of money can go a long way. That's the organization that I've chosen to give to. There are so many opportunities in our local community and internationally and nationally as well. So look for those opportunities, especially during this holiday season. And um, it'll be a win-win for everybody. All right, enough of the introduction here. I want to introduce or reintroduce my guest for today. Robert Hills with me. Robert, thank you so much for coming back to hang out on the podcast with me. Yeah. Yeah, man. I'm stoked to be here. I really appreciate uh, you inviting me on. Well, it is truly a privilege. And, and um, my apologies to you that we had to kind of jump right into the tech stuff before we got started. Yeah. We didn't even get a chance <laughs> to really have any small talk or catch up. But um, I, I have to just say, first of all, and, and it's not, I don't say this with every guest to be clear. I, sometimes I'm just kind of blown away with the photographic work of our guests and your work is, is a prime example of that. Um, I, your work is just beautiful. And I want to kind of take all of our listeners immediately to your website. First of all, it's robertjhill.com. And then, um, and we'll get, we'll come back to this of course, but then your Instagram as well, Robert J Hill on Instagram and man, just visually, your work is is stunning. I love your processing style. I like your composition, um, your the way that you handle light. It's just really, really beautifully done. And so I have to give you props to start. Thank you, man. I really appreciate that. I, I feel like you know, I feel like every every photographer is like on a constant journey of of learning to love their work. Mm. Um, and I feel like for me, it's just happened in the last like two years where I can now look back and just be like every single shoot I. I truly love it. If there's something I don't love about it, I know it's more of an internal thing, like a relationship with the person or something like that, mm. that I feel like could have been different or I could have been uh, maybe a little bit more refined up front in, in choosing whether or not I was going to take something. But um, it's, it's, I think it's just such a wild process that we all go through of the internal process of like, do we actually enjoy what we're doing and who we're working with and what's coming out from that experience? Yeah, but, but I, that's really interesting to me because honestly, most photographers, it seems like these days are talking about their insecurities and the struggles that they have with themselves and their work and the confidence and whether or not they should even start a business in the first place. And yeah. to a point, I guess I, I kind of get where they're coming from, but it's just refreshing to hear somebody say, you know what, hey, I actually like what I do. I like myself, I like the work I'm producing. Um, yeah. I think that's really cool. Where does that come from? It did it take a little bit of time to get to that place. It, I think it definitely took time. Uh, and, and I think you nailed it on the head with what you just said about the fact that like we're all going on through this internal process of, of learning to really love ourselves and like ourselves. Um, and I think that that plays the biggest role in, in liking our work. Uh, if we have an internal battle going on with ourselves, then that's going to reflect in whatever it is that we're creating in the world because whatever we're, it is that we're creating may not be as in alignment with ourselves as we know it could be. And that internal struggle that's going on between those two things, I think is what causes that chaos. Interesting. Wow. I, I, I'm already hearing another podcast episode. Like we <laughs> might have to come back to that topic because it's a loaded topic for sure. And I know a lot of nuance to it, but I, nonetheless, it's really cool to actually hear you say that. I think it's really encouraging and hopefully it'll be encouraging to our listeners as well. It, you know, sometimes as much as it's easy to, to get in our head and, and analyze and overanalyze what it is that we do and how we feel and what we're going to do next. And I mean, it's just the, the fact that we even have the luxury for that matter, to sit there and just think about that day in and day out is, is uh, pretty privileged, frankly. But that being said, I think sometimes we just have to 
push forward and just do and stop yep. thinking so much. Um, yeah. and, and I know that's easier said than done at times, but it, it, I think we would all live much better, healthier, happier lives if, if we were willing to just do that. Um, nonetheless, kudos to you for, for making that step. Now, for everybody listening in, if you missed out on the first episode that I had Robert on back in episode 302, we actually talked about the, the reason, kind of the motivation behind why we do what we do as photographers. If you missed that episode, go back and, and listen. That was over two years ago, Robert. Yeah, that was a long time ago, man. <laughs> it's a lot happened since then. <laughs> a lot, yeah. Little did we know what was to come. Yeah. Um, but we'll make sure to link to that episode in the show notes. And Robert, can you do me a favor and turn your volume down just a little bit uh, on yep. the, I think I'm still hearing an echo of me coming through. Got it. I want to make sure you can still hear me though. Can you still hear me yep, good? I got you. Okay. I got you. <laughs> okay, cool. My wife always judges me for this because I'm the guy who has headphones in and I'm just blasting music like full on. And she's like, you're going to be deaf by the time you're 50. <laughs> so my bad. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. It's all good. Well, I, I want to go ahead and jump into the conversation because our main topic today, we're going to talk about how to create emotionally evocative images. Speaking of Instagram, you created this wonderful, just beautifully designed post. Uh, a number of weeks ago, and we're going to touch on that a little bit later in the conversation. But to get started, something there are a few questions I didn't get, have the chance to ask you in our first episode, so I want to jump to those. Let's talk about customer experience. And, and yep. as much as this may seem like a cliche topic, I think that more than ever, especially considering the way that technology is making photography so much easier, we can produce a beautiful image so much easier these days. I think experience is more important than ever. The type of experience that we provide for the end client, especially when it comes to setting ourselves apart. What's a big idea for you that drives creating a really great experience for your clients? Yeah, yeah. I feel like, you know, in all the years I've been doing business, I feel like, um, you know, we're, we're, ad advice is abundant right now. Um, and execution, if anything, is very scarce. Uh, like we were just talking about that, not thinking and just taking action. And I feel like when we think about the customer, uh, the customer service experience or the customer experience, I think we oftentimes get um, a little bit tied up and, and overwhelmed with the what to do. Um, and I was doing this for the longest time. My business, when I first started it, uh, it really took off. It, I was traveling the world. I was shooting destination weddings. It, um, I was building a big following. And when I got to the end of it, I was, I was completely burnt out. I was, uh, depressed. I was, um, uh, I felt broken. I, I felt like I did everything wrong. I was insecure. I was just unconfident in every single way. Um, and that's when I started to shift into, uh, really, due to hiring coaches and working with with people who were outside of our industry, really starting to lean more into the who I am versus what I do. And I think that that plays a part in even what we were just talking about with our work and how much we enjoy our work is that when we focus on what we should do to create a great experience, uh, experience for customers, we're in this thinking process rather than being in this who are we and who do we want to be. Um, and so whenever I think about the customer service experience, I think that the really the customer experience is, is a reflection of your life experience. And mm. if you're not truly living the life that you want to be living, if you're not living in alignment with your values, if you're not waking up every day inspired just because of who you are, I think it's really difficult to create a customer experience that's worth talking about, that's worth remembering, um, that's worth sharing with the world. Um, and so that's a lot of the stuff that I've been focused on for, for several years now. And what I, what I work with all my coaching clients on um, is, is much more of the personal aspect of things of how is it that you are developing a life that you wake up inspired every day because that's the thing that's really gonna drive creativity to help you create a customer experience that isn't something that you have to sit there and compare with everybody else, but something that you just feel like I've dialed this in, this is true to me, and this is what I, I really wanna be doing with my business. Wow. Again, I mean, I, I actually, I guess it's kind of a continuation of our conversation, but this is such a loaded topic and, and I, I wish we could spend time here. Like there's so much other stuff to get into today, but yeah, um, maybe we can come back and do another episode. I'm curious though, if, if totally. you were to, first of all, just to kind of sum up what you're saying, the way that I heard it, we have to be healthy personally in order to be creating a good customer experience. We've got to be in a yeah. good place, especially when it comes to emotional and psychological health. We need to be in a yeah. great place. And um, it, it seems like it's very, very commonplace these days to, for photographers to talk about the struggles that they're having in that regard. And of course, again, there's nuance to it. There are you know, different, different dynamics, different life experiences, and, and ultimately different psychological makeup as a result. But is there, is there a big, I mean, well, actually, let me start first. Is there a resource or a couple of resources um, that you would recommend to our listeners who maybe feel like they're struggling in that regard 
need to be able to step beyond that, but just feel stuck. Where would you send them? Yeah. I mean, I feel, Hmm. I love what you just said there about like, we have to be healthy to create a really healthy experience. Mm. I always think of it because customer service really comes down to service, right? Mm. Like we're here to serve. Um, and that's an easy thing to say when it comes to other people. Uh, however, if we're not serving ourselves, uh, the way we serve people is a reflection of how we serve ourselves. And so, um, I'd say like the simplest resource, which I think can be also a very big challenge because this is something that I don't feel like we're, we're taught to do this, but is to really think about what do I want to see, what do I want out of every single day? Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I do with all my, my clients that I think is a huge first step um, in ultimately starting to define your values. Uh, granted, it's just kind of a baby step in that process is I always like to throw out um, what are five emotions that you feel every single day, like, or, or most days, what are five emotions that are recurring in your life? Um, and typically I get things like insecurity, anxiety, uh, stress, overwhelm, um, uh, frustration, anger, sadness, like I get all of those, right? Um, and then we flip the we flip the page and we go, okay, what are five emotions that you want to experience every day? If a magic yeah. genie just got to snap his fingers, what yep. would those five emotions be? Mm -hmm. And they start throwing out things like calm and peaceful and joy and you know whatever else comes up. Um, and sometimes I can take a minute to really figure those out. Um, but then from there, I tell them, okay, go uh, tomorrow. First, write them down. And then secondly, look at those right before you go to bed and let those be the first thing you look at when you wake up. And as soon as you wake up, get into a place of creativity of how you can start to make choices that will help you feel the, that way. Because that's, that's the work that, you know, again, going back to the what you do versus who you are, you can go take a workshop all day long about customer service, but do you have the, the capacity as an individual, the stability as a, as a, individual the responsibility is an individual to, to actually take action on those things um and so that's the kind of the personal journey i think that we all are in of going okay how do we start to actually choose to live this way right we have to make the choice and we have to take the action to do it um and sometimes that can be difficult too because it it's going to bring up decisions that may may be uncomfortable in the process yeah. uh, of of starting to make those shifts but you know frankly that's part of taking ownership and, and I realize yeah, this absolutely. even on a, like even in small levels, um, on a daily basis, almost for myself, I, I think it starts with a certain amount of self-awareness, which is, I don't, I, you know, I feel this way. And I think that's where, unfortunately, culture or industry, certainly, but our culture in general seems to stop. I feel this way. And then it, this becomes a label, which is my identity. And then yep. nothing. I mean, that's just where yep. it stops. And unfortunately it puts people in a, in a, in a death spiral, sometimes literally, yep. unfortunately. And so when, when we start with, I feel this way, these feelings are a result of, um, in many cases, actions or experiences that come from actions, choices that we've made. And the question then is, how do we change our daily choices for the sake of changing how we feel? And it reminds me of a conversation, or not a conversation, but a, one of my favorite books, actually. And it's actually just a simple download, free download. Uh, I know Tony Robbins has kind of some fans and not so so many yeah. <laughs> on the other side, but one of the I like things, it. well, one of the things he does really well is to kind of distill psychological principles into really simple kind of bite-sized packages that are easy to consume and go apply. Yep. Um, it, you know, it's one thing to to talk about something, but if we don't fully understand it, then and we don't know how to apply it, then then it kind of stops right there. But uh, he wrote a book uh, called "Reawaken the Giant Within." It's kind of a cheesy title, yeah. but the the content therein it's about a hundred page ebook is probably the most powerful book again as far as actionable content goes and especially yep. as it relates to our psychological health that i've ever read and we'll link to it in the show notes for anybody listening in of course we don't get any kind of kickbacks or anything for this it's just truly that powerful in fact to the extent yeah. that on my my inside of my wrist i can't remember if we talked about this before but i have yeah, these I tattoos think we did. did we okay yeah so yeah choice sentaku is the japanese word choice and then belief is on the other end other side. Mm. But he, these are principles that he talks about. And, it, and it's fascinating to understand that how we feel is driven largely by what we believe uh, about yep. our lives, about our day, about ourselves. And we have the ability to choose to restructure or even change those beliefs for the sake of a healthier, happier self. And, and then part of that process also, and you've kind of alluded to this, is establishing very clearly what makes us happy, i.e. our core values. And then intentionally living those on a day-to-day -day basis. And 
you know, people talk a lot about this idea of quote unquote, who we are and being in alignment with who we are. And, and I have some mixed feelings on that. I think for, for myself anyway, what, what makes more sense is being clear about what it is that we know brings us joy, that brings us that sense of happiness. For me, there are, when I list them all out, 10 or 11 um, ideas or values that are important to my life. And I know that if I consistently live those values, I, I'm a much better, happier person. And by the way, I'm also much more valuable to those around me when I live those yeah. out. And he talks about the significance of developing those values as well. So super, super powerful book. Yeah. And if you've not read it, I highly recommend it. But for anybody listening in or watching, we'll make sure to list to uh, link to that in the show notes. And if you do a quick search, just reawaken the giant within ebook for those of you listening or watching, you can find it as well. Um, man, this is a really cool topic. And, and maybe if you'd be willing, Robert, at some point we can come back to this and kind of dig into it as a whole topic in and of itself because it's it, there's totally. so much to get into. Yeah, yeah. This is one of those conversations I feel like when you start diving in, there's thousands of directions to go with it. Yeah, yeah. infinite content. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. By the way, I have to bring this up because I've heard it multiple times and I love it. The the rooster in the background, are, are you like yeah. <laughs> kind of out in farm country? What's the environment that you're in there? Kind of, yeah, yeah. We're So my wife and I have been living in a van for the last uh, seven months. Um, okay, cool. And, uh, so the last month has been really interesting because we've gotten to zigzag the country to see all of our family, literally I, I, I'm pretty sure just about everybody in our, just about everybody in our family over the last month. Um, and, uh, we're at our final location where, with her parents and they mm. live kind of, kind of out in kind of fa farm country, um, in Florida. Uh, so they have a couple, the rooster actually is quite aggressive. It, it, <laughs> it, it, it came at me yesterday and I was like, bro, step back. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Well, yeah. I, I love the environment, uh, the kind of ambiance, if you will. This is definitely a yeah. new one for the podcast. <laughs> well, let's keep going. Talk to me a little bit about time management. This is actually a, a great segue to what you were just saying. The fact that you're, you're able to live in a van and you're moving around, it gives you flexibility. Are there, is there an idea or two that drives your ability to manage time as a business owner and as a husband and ultimately somebody who's living kind of a flexible on the go lifestyle? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, you know, my mindset has changed a lot around managing time over the last couple of years. Um, and I have really, um, I'll kind of explain this, but I've stopped managing my time. Um, I don't like managing my time. Managing time to me is very, very stressful. <laughs> it's very overwhelming. And it's just like, how do you, what do you mean by that? Um, uh, I find that a lot of times we're, we're going through life and we're having experiences. We're, con we're, bringing in information around us every single day and we're starting to get this, this backlog of stuff in our mm. mind. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I, rather than managing time, I like to think of it as just making time. Um, and I think that a lot of times we have this, um, we have this deep seated belief that we don't have the power to create time. Um, I'd like to think of us all as time lords, uh, but we do have the power to create time. Um, and in that, what I mean by that is that Anytime that anything is coming up for me, um, I kind of have this rule or a practice. Let me let me say that because it's not yeah. perfected by any means, but a practice of I either do it right now, right here, right now, or I put it on the calendar. Um, and if there's not a time or a slot on the calendar, then I don't do it. Or if it's it, and I think doing that practice as well gives me a little bit more of a slower more responsible um, approach to it in terms of when I get to my calendar, I start to go, okay, is this something I actually feel like I need to be doing? Is this something that really matters for what it is that I'm trying to do? Um, so my, my kind of general rule is do it right now. Um, and if you can't do it right now, then just put it on the calendar. And do you do that uh, in addition to managing a task list or has that become your task list as well? Oh, it's definitely with a task list. Yeah. Okay. I think task lists are where we get so overwhelmed because you know, you start writing down everything you need to do and you're not actually able to in reality, think about how much time is each of these tasks going to take mm. and like, wh where can I make commitments and how can I have integrity with maybe if one of those tasks involve another person or a commitment or something like that we have, yeah. um, if it's not on my calendar and it's just a list of stuff, then in that, um, I'm kind of done for at that point. Another, and I guess another thing to add to this too, and this is like a little hack that I found for yeah. uh, specifically as a photographer that I found has been really helpful um, is I will uh, finish up a shoot and granted this isn't every single shoot, but most shoots what I will do is I'll, I'll finish it up um, and I'll immediately uh, schedule my reveal call with the client um, for a couple weeks from that moment. 
Um, because I find that as a photographer, it's so easy just to procrastinate above everything because mm -hmm. we don't make that time. Yeah. Um, and so I immediately set up, here's when you're going to get the delivery. Um, mm -hmm. Here's when you'll have your images. And then that I have this time window now that I know I'll be able to, or I'll know, I know I'll have to finish the project by. So um, yeah. So the only question I have about that, because I really like the thought process actually. And, and by the way, I'm full agreement with you that we do make the time for the things that we ultimately deem important. Right. And yep. um, I, I, it drives me crazy when people said I was too busy. The reality yeah. is you just chose to spend your you time in this way yeah. versus the other thing. Right. So, right. Um, but nonetheless, again, that, it, and it comes back to that idea of ownership, right? We, we, our, how we, how we feel, how we spend our time, how we live ultimately it's on us. We make the choices. Yeah. And, and if we just, just willing to take the ownership in that life changes very drastically. But yeah. I'm curious though about when it time. So I, the reason that I've tended to lean more toward task list or project list versus a calendar is in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking, I don't want to be strapped to these blocks of time. Like at this time, I got to go do this. This time I got to go do this. I want some flexibility in there. Maybe I knock out a task and then I can go do something different. Then I come back and knock out another two and then I go do something different. In my mind, that gives me a little bit more flexibility in that I'm not like if something interferes with this time block that I set up in my calendar, it doesn't matter so much because at the end of the day, I'm just going to go back to the list and knock the next thing off the list. What's yep. your response to that? I'm curious to hear how you, how you kind of balance that. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we, um, part of the idea of the making time, uh, in my mind is, is I think about the distinction between like, are you a feeler or are you a doer? Um, and oftentimes when we are leaning more on the feeler side of things, we're letting our emotions kind of run us. Um, and yeah. so being a doer, that's where I'm like, okay, just do it right now. Like, even if you don't want to do it, just do it. Because I, I heard a, um, I heard somebody say once, like, if you do something for just like three or four minutes, you'll meet the energy behind it will, will come, it will show up. Um, and so, you know, like editing, you don't want to edit, sit down for five minutes and just start editing. And all of a sudden the energy will be there and you'll go, Oh wow, this is actually kind of fun. And then you'll start editing. Um, uh, in terms of what you're speaking to, I, I'm the same way. Like, I mean, there are times where, you know, if I have filled up my calendar and I get to a block of time where I said, all right, for this block of time, I'm going to do this thing. Um, and I, at that moment go, you know what, actually, this would be a great time for me and Emily to, uh, go on a drive or go to the beach or go on a hike or something like that. Like, yeah. great. Awesome. Let's do a hike instead. And now I'll just move that to another place on the calendar. Okay. So you can shift it around. I guess that's, that's a simple yeah. enough. I, I also love that that you bring up, um, feelings as it relates to tasks. I I'm a, I'm a super emotional guy. Like I cry at a, yeah. you know, a good song that comes on or the, a yeah. rom-com. I mean, it just like, give me anything and I'll, I'll get emotional, but I, I think, and, and really the, the world is a dead place, right? Without us being willing to, and, and actually soaking in those, those emotional experiences, the flip side of that though. And I think where it gets us in trouble, especially is business owners and quote unquote artist types, the photography industry, um, has a lot of those is that we start to associate our feelings with the things that need to actually get done when yeah. really there's, they, they don't need to go together so closely. Like, it doesn't yeah. <laughs> matter if you feel like doing something or not. Sometimes it just has to be done and there's really no excuse for it. So I, I like the simplicity that you're suggesting, the sim simple notion of it has to be done. You either commit to do it or you commit to a time frame in which you're going to do it, period, yeah. full stop. And, and that helps minimize any unnecessary complication in that process. I'm curious to get your take on this too. Matt um, on Facebook says, as someone with ADHD, a task list is immensely helpful. The more detailed, the better. I often write out a task list for post shoot that is very specific, edit ceremony, edit reception, edit getting ready and check each one of them off for uh, the reward of completing it. What are your thoughts about that idea, Robert, in comparison yeah. contrast to the calendar uh, methodology that you're talking about? Yeah, I, th I think what Matt's speaking to is genius. Like, I mean, what, what I hear when I see what Matt just wrote is I hear less of task lists and I hear system. Like he's got a system and, and um, I can even, I can almost see in a, in a spreadsheet, uh, I have something like this that I, I um, uh, create accessible, or I, I give to coaching clients basically. That is a um, go into Google Sheets and mm. actually at the top, put every single step of your system. Okay. And as you're going through the step of your system, move the client forward. Right. I think that that's so great, especially because you're creating uh, early on when we're when we're starting a business and we're we're working with clients and we're putting them through. You know, there's a lot of steps between booking a client and delivering an image uh, or images. 
Um, there's a lot of steps in that process. Uh, I was doing exactly what Matt was doing early on. And now it's just, it's so second nature to me now. I know the system is in my being. Um, I effortlessly flow through it after every single shoot now. I don't need yeah. that anymore. Uh, and I think that's just like with any, any system that we build, it'll eventually just become second nature. Sure. And then when you start to teach it to somebody, somebody's like, whoa, that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, but it's just creating that habit. Okay, so that's interesting. So the, the idea of a task list in this context, where basically you get to that place on your calendar where, for example, you're supposed to edit a, a, a session or a wedding or whatever it might be for a client, and you pull that, that list, that system, um, yep. from, in this case, Google Sheets, and you reference that as you're doing that thing within that calendar time slot that, that you created for yourself. So I guess the, the two methodologies can kind of coexist in that sense. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, absolutely, 100%. Okay. Um, I think the other the other... The other thing that, that I, and this is, everybody has a different way of working, right? Like when it comes to editing and um, post-processing and that sort of thing, I am like a very much, um, I do everything in one chunk. I don't like to like edit, like some people like to cull and then they come back a couple days later and then they, you know, do their first round of edits and then they come back another, another day and they do the next round. I literally start, I cull, I edit, I post-process, I export, I upload and I'm done. Like I don't have any breaks in between. And that's just because of years of years of doing it and getting to the point where that's just how my brain works, where it's like the most efficient. Um, you know, Cal, Cal Newport talks a lot about deep work and, uh, and that's yeah. kind of a principle I think about a lot in that of just like, all right, this is my time to finalize this wedding. Mm. Um, I find that the more that I sit on a task like editing and I come back to it and stuff, it actually takes longer. Um, so now, speaking of editing, thanks for setting up my segue here, yeah. <laughs> outsourcing, delegation, you know, whether it's editing or email management or album design or administrative tasks, whatever it might be, there are opportunities as, as photographers, photography business owners to delegate tasks for the sake of saving time. Is this something that you've experimented with for the sake of time management, yeah. especially being on the road so much? Yeah, totally, totally. I, I find that time, I feel like um, outsourcing any kind of work uh, uh, in my experience, uh, has brought up a lot of fear in the past. And now working with people on it, I know fear is like a very big emotion that arises when we start to think about outsourcing. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of beliefs that we hold, like we talked about, right? Yeah. Beliefs that we hold that like, I'm the artist and I should do it. And, and it's, I think outsourcing is such a phenomenal thing. It's something you need to do. If you, if you really want to start scaling, a lot of times when I'm working with um, with photographers or other entrepreneurs um, in the coaching uh, realm of things, this, this comes up and it's really an opportunity. Something is, is kind of beating down your door, telling you to, to level up in this way. Um, and there's a little bit of work that has to go involved in, in actually stepping into that space. Um, and I think above all, when it comes to outsourcing, the biggest thing is that you're specifically with editing. And I think this is like one of the biggest myths that I believed and I see a lot of people believe when it comes to actually outsourcing editing is that when you outsource your your work to be edited, it's not meant to to be a hundred percent whatsoever. It's mm. not meant to like you send it off and then it comes back perfect, right? Like it is a process one of working with an editor over a long time to get it dialed in, right? It's just like being married like <laughs> my wife didn't fully understand me when we first got married and i didn't fully understand her but the yeah. longer we're married the more we're understanding each other right mm. the more i'm able to uh serve her in greater ways and vice versa and so it's the same thing with outsourcing and i think that that's where uh outsourcing really um with editing it's not about being 100 percent, but i think additionally with that it's it's 100 percent about co-creation um, and constantly coming back to that place of co-creation. Mm. Um, I find that a lot of times people get caught with outsourcing because of the specific, the financial aspect of it and how sure. difficult it is to let go of the money to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of those things that you just kind of have to take the leap and, and be committed to the outcome like with anything uh, and know that it's going to be a little bit of a process to get to where it is you really want to be. And that you summed it up beautifully. And, and that's the case with any kind of delegation, really. You can't yeah. expect that handing something to somebody else who can't read your mind is going to be able to. I mean, it, it may happen in some cases. and That's great. I mean, I know photographers that have sent work to photographers edit, for example, talk about, oh, my word, they're just you know, mind blown and, and you edit better than me. And I mean, a lot of a lot of great accolades. But to be very clear, that doesn't happen every time. Sometimes yeah. it takes a little bit of a process, to your point, 
a commitment to that relationship over the long run, which then ultimately yep. brings the results and brings the freedom. But we have to be willing to do that. And uh, if a photographer, whether de delegating editing or album design or administrative tasks or whatever it might be, if they're not willing to commit to that process, I think in many cases, maybe even most cases, they're going to be very disappointed because the expectation is not in the right place. The ex you know, this idea that they can just dump the thing in the person's lap, walk away, hope that it, that it turns out perfectly, and then they're pissed off when it's not. It's, yep. that's just not how, it's not how life works. I mean, you think about like, I, I think I made this example just recently on the podcast, but anytime you, I, I don't know if you, did, have you ever worked for another company, like a retail company, maybe when you were oh, younger yeah. or something? Yeah. yeah. So you yeah. go to work for this company and what do they do? The first thing they do when you get there is they, they train you. And then there's yeah. an ongoing feedback and training as well. That's just part of working for somebody else. So anytime we delegate something to somebody, we are the boss, they are the trainee or the employee, and we have to treat the situation very comparably or in many, if not most cases, we're going to be pretty disappointed. So I love the way that you sum that up. Um, I want to go ahead and transition to, to just a couple more questions here because I want yeah. to dig into our main topic. But the you mentioned earlier the, the book uh, Deep Work. And I, yep. I haven't personally read it, but I've heard wonderful things about it as well. Is that one of your favorites? Do you have another book recommendation no. you might throw out there for our <laughs> listeners? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I actually don't like deep work. <laughs> oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. I started reading it, um, and it, it. Let me let me preface this with it could have very well, more than likely, it was because of the season I was in at the okay. time. Yeah. Um, but I started reading it. Uh, actually, I think I was listening to the audio version of it, and I got like maybe a fifth of the way through it. And I immediately was just done. Like I was like, all right, got it. I understand what he's saying and I don't need any, anything else that he's saying mm. at that time. Mm. Um, and so I, I'm sure it's a great book. It's a bestseller. Everybody references it. Right. Um, but I, I think the first part of the book in starting to read it, I understood what he was speaking to in it and I understood how to apply it immediately and yeah. why I, and how I wasn't applying it. Um, I also have the rule with any book that like, if you start reading a book, it doesn't mean you have to finish the book. Like if, you, if the book <laughs> stops giving you what it is that you feel like you're needing right now, just put it yeah. down and come back to it if you want to in the future. Yeah. I, it's unfortunate that so many business self-help books, like maybe 20% of the book is applicable, actionable information. Then there's all this fluff and repetition and it does yeah. feel like a waste of time in a lot of cases, unfortunately. So I, yeah. I, I hear your pain on that. Is there a book that comes to mind that you'd recommend like right off the bat to anybody that, that was wanting a reference? Yeah. Yeah. I've, you know, it's, it's actually been interesting. Cause I, I feel like, um, something I've been thinking about a lot in the last season of life, uh, 2021 has been a very interesting year for me. And one of the things that's been on my mind a lot is, um, the, the difference between consuming and creating or consuming and contributing. Um, and I've always been somebody for the longest time that just consumes, 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 consumes. Um, and you know, I think, I think we can even get to the point of consumption where, uh, you know, our ego can start to come into play and be like, Oh, look at how many books I read and all of that. Right. And it's great. But for me, um, with all the books I've read, it's, it's helped me gain a lot of knowledge. Um, but if we're not integrating and applying that knowledge, then that knowledge really means nothing. You yeah. may be smart, but your actions are always going to really show who you are and what you can do for people, you know? And so, um, so this season I've actually, I went on a kind of a hiatus where I, I stopped consuming any kind of content, um, for about six months and it was so refreshing, uh, cause it forced me to just take action on what I wanted to take action yeah. on. Um, but the, uh, the one book that I have read in the last, in the last year that I think was really valuable right before I took my, uh, my hiatus now, funny enough, I'm reading like six books now. Um, right before I took my, my hiatus, I, um, I was reading a book by Peter Block um, and it was called the answer to how is yes. Okay. Um, and it was basically speaking to uh, how we as a society have gotten obsessed with the how to and how we are just begging for somebody to tell us what to do um, and how much that is one uh, forcing us to do a lot of things that absolutely don't matter to us and, um, uh, but also do things that aren't actually leading to where it is that we want to want to be and what it is that we really want to create. And I see this, you know, in the business world so much, you know, when people come in to do a coaching session with me, one of the first things that they are, or I mean, typically what we get down to is like, okay, how do you do this? Right. And of course, as coach, as a coach, you want to give people practical, tangible how to's actionables 
that they can go and, and take action on. Um, but I think what, what, where we get stifled, where we get blocked and stuck a lot of times is we're trying to figure out the how to for the entire thing. And, um, rather than just being committed to the process, just like we were talking about with outsourcing, it's like, we want to know exactly every single step that it's, that it's going to take to make this thing be a success so that we can trust it rather than trust ourselves in taking action on the thing right now and letting it be a co-creation, letting it be a process in which we're going to continuously show up and be creative and let the process evolve over time to get us to where we really want to be. So that, um, that was a good book. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to link to it too in the show notes, bocapodcast.com for anybody listening in. Um, this will, these show notes will go along with the episode and, and so you can look out for that. The answer to how is yes, acting on what matters by Peter Block. I've got that pulled up here on the screen for those of you that are live streaming. Thanks for the recommendation, Robert. Um, one quick last question for you. And I know we could probably spend a lot of time here too, uh, yep. but it first gear item of camera gear that comes to mind. Like if, if somebody's like, what's your favorite piece of camera gear in your bag right now? What's that thing? So it's changed recently. Uh, right now it is a um, Mamiya C330. Uh, I started shooting film a couple years ago, but just picked up a, a walked into a camera store with a buddy of mine um, uh, early this summer and had no intentions of buying anything. He did. Uh, and I walked in and saw this thing and I was just like, oh gosh, <laughs> it's over. <laughs> so I've been shooting uh, medium formats uh, as well as 35 millimeter all summer. Um, so I'd say that or my, my 35 millimeter camera. Um, I've just been Film has changed the game for me in this season. It's it's really um, reinvigorated my my love for photography. Um, I feel like I, I feel like I was honestly kind of getting ready to put the camera down, um, and and film has definitely um, brought it all back around for me. Just the the process of it, the um, the uncertainty of it, the unknown of it, the yeah, shooting something and just waiting for it, like yeah. all of it has been. It definitely I feel like. Um, it's a game of trusting yourself. And I think that that's a game that we all need to be playing in some shape, form or fashion. Um, but I think that that plays in, even like we said at the beginning about, you know, liking your work or not. Um, are you trusting yourself with the work that you're creating? That's, that's been a huge, huge insight for me in this last year of playing with film. And this is the camera here, the twin lens camera, the C330, yep. is that right? Yeah, it's really funny too because whenever you use this, because it's a it's a twin uh, twin lens, um, yeah. it's all reversed on the inside yeah. as well. So uh, yep. you feel drunk when you're when you're shooting with it. <laughs> yep. You're kind of swaying, and people are like, "You're all right," and they're like, "Yeah, it's just going to take me a minute to get this <laughs> dialed in." So, yeah, yeah. The, one of my favorite cameras, I still own it, um, and I photographed a number of clients with it. Is a Yashica um, twin yeah. lens camera. It's six by six as well, medium format, and I I just love that thing. But you're right. You you pop that thing, look through the top viewfinder, and start to move. And you're like, wait a minute, what am I doing? What? Why is it yep. going this the opposite direction? But I just love yeah. the tangible experience of everything being completely manual. Um, I, I think it's a it's a great it's a almost meditative experience, honestly, where you have to take your time with each shot and set up the settings. And I just I love that thing. I and I yeah. as much as I talk about it, I need to shoot with it more. But yeah, I, I, it's an incredible experience. It's fascinating too to see how people interact with film. Like when you pull out that camera, or even like a 35 millimeter. Like I have a, a little Canon AE1, um, and anytime I pull one of those cameras out, people act differently than if you have a digital camera. Um, uh, I've I've gotten to capture this. This year has been a huge year for me to to um, capture as many people in my life that, that really mean something to me as I can. Um, and so that's kind of been just like a personal thing I've been doing all year is cool. uh, there's all these people in my life that I I've never photographed. And so this year has been the year that I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to get everybody that I can. So, um, uh, I got to photograph my, my wife all year long. And when the images came back, we were both just absolutely blown away. Um, and uh, we, we got into this big conversation about mm. how digital versus film makes her feel when she's in front of the camera. Mm. Um, and so it's just been this interesting, interesting thing to observe, you know, shooting film and seeing how people interact with it. So yeah, it's been fun. That's cool. Yeah, I'm gonna, man, you know what, speaking of, I think I should probably just take my camera to Christmas and photograph around my family. I think that would be a really cool project. I, I really yeah. don't shoot enough. Wow. And, and again, such a loaded topic. I appreciate you kind of sharing your insight on these various 
Um, they're supposed to be quick fire questions and, and it's my <laughs> fault. It, they're never quick. <laughs> yeah. I saw 15 seconds. I'm like, this is not going to be 15 <laughs> seconds. Not gonna be, no. <laughs> well, um, for everybody listening in, uh, if you're not following Robert on Instagram, I'm going to pop up his Instagram account here actually on screen for anybody who's live streaming. You can see this Robert J Hill. And Robert, I actually meant to allude to this earlier when we were talking about relationships. You just posted recently, let's see, this was December 9th. So anybody listening in, you can go back to Robert's Instagram account, go to December 9th, six insights on how to deepen relationships and create a greater client experience. Make sure that you reference that. We're not going to get into it now, but yet again, a really beautifully designed post that touches on some of the ideas that we discussed earlier. I'm going to scroll down a little bit though. And this post right here, and this is from November 7th. And again, for anybody who's listening and you want to reference the post yourself, Robert J. Hill, just like it sounds on Instagram, uh, creating five simple steps to creating emotionally evocative images. And um, I, I reached out to you and said, hey, can we do a podcast episode on all of this? And um, it, you were gracious enough to come back and do this. So I, I appreciate this. Now, I know for me, th I, I think, and I know we, we all have kind of different approaches for, to, to photography, but when it comes to creating a great image, for me, if I've got good light uh, and I'm able to e evoke really great emotion, I, I literally can photograph an image in a Walmart parking lot and I'd be happy to give that to a client and even blow it up, stick it on their wall because those two elements in my mind are really what drive an incredible image. Now, composition obviously plays, it plays a role, especially when you have a beautiful background, but I think that in many cases, especially for photographers who are, I think struggle a little bit with this notion of introversion and how to in engage with somebody that they're not comfortable with, they're not um, familiar with in many cases, the question would be, how do I pull out that emotion? Because I've heard way too many photographers just kind of give these like robotic instructions to, you know, they've heard some other photographers say, and there's little to no emotion. It doesn't feel genuine. It sounds like they're just repeating some robotic commands in order to try to pull something out sounds cheesy in many cases. In many cases, they're frankly irrelevant ideas, suggestions, commentary to the client. The client's like, what are you talking about? Like they, they don't know how to engage with that. Um, so big question mark is how do we create Im images that are emotionally evocative? And yeah. uh, you did this beautiful job of, of outlining this on Instagram. So I want to just jump into this question and, and actually just, I'm, I'm literally scrolling on screen here to, to these points. Um, you, first of all, you say that to capture intimacy, you must create intimacy. And I'm curious what you mean by that, by that statement. Yeah. So when I think about, um, when I think about, uh, well, I think this goes for any, any realm of photography. Um, but what I have, um, you know, I've shot a lot, I've shot every kind of photography I can, I can imagine, um, throughout the 17 plus years that I've been shooting, but, I really settled on couples um, was where I found kind of my sweet spot. And, um, you know, at first, when I first dove in, it was very much like, all right, yeah, I, I am a quote unquote good enough photographer. I know I can go and do the job and deliver a result. Thus, somebody is willing to pay me for my skill. And so I'll just start having these transactions and we'll just build a business off this. Um, the more I got into it, though, the more I realized that um, in a lot of different ways, the more I realized that the relationship that I was building with the people that I was working with, that was the, the biggest, the biggest um, motivating drive behind my work. Uh, and when I say relationship, I don't, mean, um, I don't mean that I'm being friends with every single one of my clients. I don't have the capacity to be friends with every single one of my clients. Um, Interesting. Uh, and so I'm not aiming to be their friend. Um, sometimes that just naturally happens, but I sure. am showing up to serve them and I am showing up to be present with them and to be very, very, very real with them. Um, and so intimacy is that thing that, that for me has, has, uh, evolved over time, um, uh, in, in terms of how to go about creating intimacy. But if I haven't done the upfront work of creating intimacy with the people I'm working with, the result that I'm going to get is going to be, um, different if anything it's not going to be it's not going to be what it could be yeah um, yeah it's not going to be as meaningful as it could be um and i think that it's so interesting because i feel like this is is really starting to to 
come about in our awareness and our consciousness right now because we now look at Instagram and people are like, well, shoot, like not, you know, the marketing that worked five years ago where we could just show up and post one photo a day every day or twice a day, it's not really working anymore. Um, and so it's really, it's really coming down to like, how are you caring for your clients and how, to what degree do you matter to your clients? Um, and that's where that intimacy game comes in of, of what it is that we're doing, how we're building relationships beforehand um, and really truly caring for people rather than just caring about, you know, the check that we're getting from them at the end of the day or, or even just caring about, you know, the, the images that we're creating um, and how cool they may be or um, what they may do for us. Does that make sense? I, I think so, <laughs> but uh, maybe just to kind of build on this because, um, and, and I'm going to kind of bring your uh, Instagram account back up here. So you said in that first slide to capture intimacy, you must create intimacy. And then the first step toward creating these emotionally evocative images is to build a relationship. And you're talking about this now. I'm curious how these two or three concepts coexist. So you're talking about building intimacy. I, I, I guess I first want to understand what intimacy means to you, because then coupled with that, you were saying you don't, you don't try to become friends with these individuals, yet you're there to be emotionally vulnerable and ultimately serve these people. How do these, how does all of that coexist in, in one thing? Because I would agree with you, by the way, we can't, there's no way that we can be emotionally vulnerable to the extent that we develop relationships, friendships, ongoing friendships with every sure. single one of our clients. We just don't have the capacity for that. But right. how do we, the thing that bothers me is fake. I, I just, I, it drives me crazy. And I've, I've had way too much personal experience in my life with fake relationships, um, yep. dishonesty, uh, a lack of transparency in some cases, maybe not necessarily dishonest, but a lack of transparency. And then ultimately just a show, right? Where somebody, you can tell that person looking at you and the way that they're talking to you, the look in their eyes, the tone in their voice, it is an absolute show that's being put on. And you never, you don't know what actually is going on behind the scenes. Um, so I, if we're going to bring that true so-called emotional vulnerability and transparency to the relationship and really give ourselves to this client, how do we do that effectively while simultaneously not developing a relationship? I, I, I yeah, help me understand yeah. better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, I think the language is where we start to get a little bit confused here um, okay. because I think relationship and friendship are very much intertwined and mm. with what we've been told as well over the last several years with social media, right? Like we have friends on Facebook, but I may have thousands of friends on Facebook, but that doesn't mean that they're the people I'm doing life with. They're not, they're not the people that I am investing in every single day. They're, they're more acquaintances, you know? Um, and that's, that's, that's what I mean by that. I mean, I can show up and I can truly care for my clients. I can be present with my clients. I can uh, be extremely authentic and vulnerable and real with my clients. Um, but that doesn't mean that after their wedding, we're going to hang out every single week and go grab drinks. Maybe sometimes every once in a while, if, if it works out, if we really had that, that level of a connection. But when I speak to intimacy, I just mean connection. Um, human to human connection. How is it that we're showing up and how present are we being with the people that we are with hmm. to help them actually see us and us see them? People, every single one of us has one deep desire in life that's to be seen, heard, and understood. The level at which hmm. we do that is going to determine the level of the relationship that we have with people, right? So like you hmm. and I have a relationship, but we aren't friends. Like we're not hanging out all the time, texting each other all the time. Sure. But that doesn't mean we don't have a relationship and we'll continue that relationship. And maybe it turns into that one day, maybe it hmm. doesn't fate will decide that, but that doesn't mean that right here, right now, I can't show up and deliver every bit of value I can for you and what you're, what you're building and just be present with you and with who you are and, and vice versa. And we can just have those experiences where we walk away going, damn, like yeah. I really got something out of that today. I feel different today because of how Nathan showed up today because yeah. of how he made me feel or because of how he saw me or how yeah. he understood me or, you know, that sort of thing. So that that makes sense. That that very much resonates, and I, and I internally I can understand that distinction a little bit better. Which is, I show up, and, and if, I know we're using a lot of these words that have become almost cliche in our culture these days. But if if there's if there's I guess true intention behind them, then they actually have meaning, right? So we show up with a with a level of genuineness, a transparency. We're not trying to hide anything. We're not trying to put on a show. We're truly present, as you were talking about, with this person, engaging with them where they are and doing our best to serve their needs, meet their needs in the context of this, the shoot, uh, or maybe even the conversation leading up to the shoot. And yep. that, that very makes, that very much makes sense because I'm not then carrying the, 
what might feel like overwhelming baggage of having to carry on that relationship after the fact. It's just about showing up in that moment in a really genuine yep. way. And so that, that very much makes sense. And I'm curious to get your take on this. And, and Matt, by the way, thanks for the ongoing questions and comments, Matt. And by the way, I know we've got others streaming right now. Y'all don't be hesitate or don't hesitate to, uh, to comment. Don't be shy. Matt says, I think that's really important to be able to recognize when that type of relationship is not built due to an inc incompatibility of personalities or whatever. I've shot clients in the past who my wife and I just didn't have a connection with and images reflected that. We don't click, take clients on these days unless we just totally hit it off. So uh, Matt, again, I appreciate your, your commentary and, and I'm gonna actually push back here and kind of get your take on this too, Robert. Where is the balance between what we're talking about building emotional intimacy? If, if I was gonna play devil's advocate um, to that idea and even to what Matt's saying, sometimes the client just wants to be photographed. They don't care the emotional engagement so much. They just want to be photographed. They have this idea. They need a photographer. Please photograph me. And it, it feels like maybe in some cases as photographers, we, we make, we build it up too much in our heads. Where's the balance between like, I'm absolutely not going to photograph somebody unless I connect with them emotionally. Um, and then the kind of the opposite end of the extreme, which is I'm just like, I'm, I'm like way too involved here and I'm emotionally drained when I get done. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> so, um, so the first thing that comes to mind when you, when you were saying all of that was, uh, I was thinking, but do I want to work with that person? Hmm. And that's, that's where I personally would say, no, like, I don't, I don't want that. I don't want to work with somebody who doesn't want that. Okay. And why I say that is because in my experience and the meaning that I have seen, uh, that I have experienced with photography, that's where the meaning comes in. The images that, that bring tears to our eyes are, are of moments and of people that meant something to us. And so if you're just wanting to hire me to go out and photograph you and make you look cool and pretty to go on Instagram, that's not, that's not my client. Um, and that's one of those things I've had to discover along the way, you know, of, of working with enough of those clients, because whenever I do work with those clients, they don't get the real version of me. Um, I, I find that the relationship with any client, whether it's with photography or with coaching or uh, with uh, an industry vendor or anybody, that that level in which I can show up and be truly myself and share any part of myself without holding anything back, that is going to determine how meaningful that person is to me, how much trust I have with that person, how much intimacy and connection I've built with that person. I'm not in this to just make a quick buck and make people look pretty. I want to have some type of be it small or large, I want to have a transformative impact on their life. I want them to walk away with something where they go, damn, like that was, that was not what we were expecting whatsoever. Mm. Um, I don't want them just to come in and, and um, rely on me just to create something for them. At that point, it's not a co-creation. That's, that's me creating something for them rather than them coming in and us both making a commitment to create something together. That makes sense. And I guess that's kind of what I'm talking about, though, too. And again, just playing devil's advocate here, because I'm actually yeah. a fan of the concept that you're talking about. But at the same time, I don't know, like how many clients are we writing off for the sake of this kind of and, and I'm being dramatic here just for the sake of conversation, yeah, yeah. but yeah. like I this kind it. of self-important <laughs> notion that, oh, I we're co-creating something. Um, if, if I'm not feeling them, then they can go somewhere else. Like maybe there's an opportunity just to take care of that client, even if they don't want to engage at that level. And I realize it's a preference, a subjective thing in the end. But are we missing out on opportunities maybe to serve somebody in a different way just by writing them off if they don't fit that that mold for us? Yeah, I, absolutely. I first off, I um, I also have this belief that every client does want that, and that okay. you as a photographer can evoke that out of them. That's what our job really is. I'm not sitting here declining clients, maybe on occasion, if it's like for sure, we are not a good fit, but that's a rare situation. A lot of this is going to come back into play with your marketing as well. What, how are you actually sharing yourself with the world? Are you sharing yourself in a very authentic way with the world? Because if you are energetically, the same type of people or similar type of people are going to come to you, be attracted to you and in turn want to work with you because of how you've shown up and how you've served them before they ever heard about you, right? So there's a whole aspect of the type of clients that are coming to you. And a lot of times when I have a coaching client come in and they're going, I am not working with the type of clients I want to work with whatsoever. 
that's one of those big areas that we have to that we have to dive into is okay you you say you want to work with more clients that are in alignment with you how are you showing up and sharing yourself with the world that is true and authentic so that people can go man i align with that person mm. not just in their work but within who they are and in turn this isn't somebody who i just think i'll get cool images from but this is somebody who i think i would actually get along with as well Okay. Okay. Well, fair enough. And, and, uh, to that point, actually, Jason Sebastian on Facebook says emotionally evocative images is what I hope to pull from every image. And Jason, thanks to Robert. We're going to um, continue to kind of explore how to do that. I appreciate your commentary and anybody that's live streaming again, don't hesitate to comment, to ask questions. We've got a couple more points to touch on here, and I'm going to actually share my screen. Uh, once again, this post on November 7th at uh, Robert J Hill on Instagram, the second and third point I'll tie together uh, here because they're both related cultivate trust and create safety. It seems like they kind of go hand in hand and really can play on some of these ideas that you were talking about, showing up, showing vulnerability. And when they see that you're willing to kind of put yourself out there in that regard, maybe they'll respond in kind. But at the same time, again, like not everybody's kind of wired the same way. Some have bigger, thicker walls <laughs> up, if you will, in the context of those relationships. Is there something that you're doing to encourage a little bit of softness in that context? Because not everybody's going to fall, kind of fall into that, that flow as easily as maybe others will. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And that's, um, it's, it's, I love that you referenced the other, like how to build a relationship post, because a lot of that is playing a part in, in this as well. Um, Creating trust and, and safety um, for me really comes down to vulnerability. Um, and that's one of those things that when we're in the mindset that we're just in this to you know, deliver a product and really sell what we do rather than sell who we are, um, this is like a big, a big um, uh, ravine that we've got to kind of cross to where we can step into this place where we're starting to connect with people in a bigger way. Um, and being vulnerable is, is huge in that, like vulnerability breeds vulnerability. And so in that, when I show up with a client, um, if I'm really wanting to create trust, trust is built off of vulnerability. Um, reliability is built off of my strengths. If I'm showing up and going, wow, look at this. I'm such a good photographer. I'm so, uh, uh, I know I'm going to, uh, I'm sure I'm going to show up and I'm going to crush this shoot and I'm going to deliver a great experience. We can say all of these things and they can create a lot of reliability. But if we're not showing up with vulnerability along with those strengths, we're not going to be creating a ton of trust. And that in that trust is when we start to feel safety, when we start to be able to open up. And so okay. um, I talk about, I actually have a book where I kind of, I've written, um, it's like a small ebook uh, that you can download off my website that basically walks through a lot of this stuff more in depth and a lot of my posing process. Um, the book is called Poser. Uh, and in that I dive into one of the biggest things that I'm, I'm really focused on one of my intentions when I show up to a shoot is how to eliminate insecurities. Um, and to eliminate an insecurity, we have to be aware of the insecurity. And so uh, in that, one of, one of the things that I'm doing with clients before I show up is asking the question, like, what is it that you are insecure about? Because if we can't have that honest question, I'm not gonna be able to shoot in such a way where I can have the intention to eliminate those things. Um, I'm going to be shooting more for, wow, that's such a cool background or wow, that's such cool lighting. And those things are wildly important. Um, however, showing up and, and actually helping our clients feel safe, uh, letting them know it's okay to be exactly who you are. You don't need to be anybody different. And if there is something that you would like to uh, see in your images that maybe you don't see in yourself in everyday life, I, I have the power to make that happen, but I can't do that unless I actually know what those things are. Well, and as you were talking here, I, I pulled up, and I'll do it again, uh, your book on your website. So if, if you all are listening in, if you go to robertjhill.com and then click on, oh, there we go, click on education and, um, and then read my book, you'll see uh, where you can just share your name and email and, and get a copy of that book. We'll make sure to link to that in the show notes as well. And we got a couple more comments. Kevin uh, Warren says, for me, I like to meet before to find connection. And yeah, I mean, but to be clear, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing back on some of this for the sake of conversation. I definitely, I'm feeling you all on, on the connection. I had the opportunity to photograph weddings for over 10 years. And certainly the thing that I look back on most fondly is the connection that I had with our clients. It was, it, it's humbling, in fact, even to think back on the way that they were letting us into their lives. And uh, the opportunity that we had to be in these these special occasions with them really incredible so i'm all for connection um, but I, the thing i think that i kind of push back on a little bit is that we get so caught up in what it is that we want 
uh, out of a session or what we want from a client. And part of that in some cases, maybe us trying to meet some emotional needs that we have. And, and you see this kind of playing out. And that, that's, that's partially where I, where I push back. And, and actually to that point, Matt said, vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. And this is from Brene Brown. And so I have a question kind of playing around this idea because I know as, as popular as Brene is, I, I'm not the biggest fan. And I think the reason is not because I don't think that some of the ideas, the concepts she talks about are important or, or have carry significant weight, in fact. Um, it's that in order to get there, I have to listen to like 30 minutes of her going on about her personal baggage. And that's just kind of exhausting to me. Like I, I get it. I get the idea of having been to a certain place and having certain experiences and those ultimately make us what we are. And we can learn from that and grow from that. And I think that's great. But in my mind, there's, there's a little bit better balance to be had again, subjective, I realize, but yeah. when, when we go scrolling through Facebook pages by photographers or just their culture at large under the guise of vulnerability, in many cases, people are just kind of dumping all of their baggage out there for the world. And yep. it's exhausting. Like, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to read that nonstop. Again, I think I there's agree. a balance to be had. It's one thing to be vulnerable and open in the sense that you're willing to go there if need be. But um, where, where is that balance for you? When you talk about being vulnerable, yeah. especially to a client who you may only interact with once or twice, where's the yeah. balance between the so-called vulnerability and not oversharing? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I get that question a lot. <laughs> uh, so, I, first off, I totally understand what you're speaking to. Like when you're going through Instagram or Facebook and people are just dumping, right? That is emotionally exhausting. And that's not what I'm speaking to when it comes to vulnerability whatsoever. Um, I would call that more processing, public processing. Uh, that is not what I think is effective <laughs> whatsoever for your business, for your brand. Don't yeah. go and publicly process on the world. Yeah. Um, what I speak to with vulnerability is being able to speak to the things that you are going through or have gone through that you have gotten a grasp on that you have been able to process to a degree so that you can share them in a way that's going to be valuable to somebody. Um, and so the, the distinction I like to often use with this is even though it is a little gross, uh, is that there's a big difference between open wounds and scars. Um, and mm. in between that time you have scab, you mm. have a scab, right? Mm. So, uh, if there's something going on that you are super emotionally reactive about, sharing the open wound of it is not going to be valuable to other people because it's going to be pussy, it's going to be gross, it's going to be bloody. They're going to be able to feel the the reaction and the energy, the negative energy, the heavy, dense energy behind that thing that you may be processing. They'll be able to feel that if that's what you're sharing with them. That doesn't add value to other people's lives. That doesn't make somebody's life lighter and more free and more yeah. peaceful and more calm, yeah. it makes it more sad and, and depressing and heavy. Right. And so, yeah. um, uh, sharing the scabs and the, st and the scars is what I'm speaking to sharing the things that, that you can go, okay, I know I screwed up on this thing in life, or I went through this thing that was so difficult, or this is how I felt about this thing, but this is what I learned from it. We have to have the the outcome to it, the result that we got to because of going through that thing when we're sharing vulnerably. And so it's not about publicly processing and dumping. It's about sharing that we aren't perfect. And in that, when we do that, that helps other people realize, oh, well, I'm not perfect as well. And in mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. now I feel safe to actually be fully myself in front of your camera rather than thinking I have to be this Instagram supermodel like everyone else that you photograph. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a both and situation where it's being able to, and, and this goes for anything, right? Not just on a shoot, talking with a client of, of, you know, being vulnerable in a shoot. It's in the conversation. I'm vulnerable with clients in the, in the upfront conversation with them. The first phone call I have with them, I'm super vulnerable with them because I want them to know who I am. And as I let them know who I am, they start to open up and I can discover more of who they are. And then that starts to build. And we continue doing that in the weeks ahead or months ahead, leading up to their shoot or elopement or whatever. Um, and that's, that is, that is what I, um, uh, that's the credit that I give any, any of my work. And that's why I love my work. Um, mm. like I said, because I love the process that I go through with couples. I mm. love when they walk away and they feel connected and they feel more connected to each other. Uh, they feel like they're inspired to do something new with their life. They feel, um, elated that the experience we had and the value that they got from it was completely worth it. And they want to do it all again. So I want to jump back here and we've got just a few minutes, um, steps four and five, encourage them and direct don't pose. Now I don't want to kind of mistakenly convolute the two of these, uh, or combine them, but it, it seems like 
the direction process in a shoot itself is very much a combination of those two things. You know, if, if a photographer and you see this, to be fair, in the context of a workshop, but I've seen this countless times where at a workshop and you've got a model right there, sometimes it's a model who knows what they're doing, other times not. But photographers are just click, 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 click without any direction or little to no direction to that person on the other side of the camera. And you got to at least wonder, like, is that is that the, what their client experience looks like as well? Yeah. People are so co uncomfortable being in front of the camera that uh, just to begin with. And then when somebody's pointing at a camera and all you hear is this clicking sound, and you don't know if you're doing well or not, like what you're supposed to even be doing. It makes it yeah. even more awkward, right? I mean, even me yeah. as a photographer, I would feel awkward. So what does it mean on a very tangible kind of practical level to encourage them? And again, I, I would I would reiterate here, not just simply throw out phrases that you've repeated a thousand other times to a thousand other couples, and it sounds that way, but like genuinely encourage the person in the moment. Yeah, yeah. So there's nothing specific that I could just rattle off like a script in terms of like, this is what I'm saying. Right? Sure. Um, my, my goal, my intention with every shoot um, is I'm a romantic. I, I love um, uh, romantic, dramatic movies. Um, I love um, the idealism behind romance. Um, mm -hmm. I love... Um, I love that pocket of time in which we are starting to, to uh, physically connect with another person in a really honest, genuine, vulnerable way. Um, that reality that we live in. Um, um, I often, when I'm working with a couple, and, I, and I'll tell them all of this up front, um, I, my goal with every shoot, and people laugh at this, but my goal with every shoot is that I want you to go and just be in bed together all night after our shoot. Like mm. I want to get us there, right? Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm in this specifically what I'm trying to get us to for what I'm trying to capture is kind of like almost like the pre foreplay pocket. That's where I'm really <laughs> trying to get to. Okay. And that takes a lot of safety to get there. That takes sure. a lot of us getting real with one another so that they feel comfortable getting there with me. Um, and I'm doing that because that's when I feel we, we end up um, when we're in that space, we touch our partners differently. We care for our partners differently. We hold our partners differently in that space. Um, and so that's kind of what I've, I've built my entire brand around is how to build a relationship with people to build enough trust to get us to that pocket. And that's when the magic happens. Um, the more that I've been able to dial in how to get people there, um, and that, that's come through that creation of intimacy and connection and relationship, that's what's really um, been the backbone behind my work. And so um, in encouraging them, what I am trying to uh, really just be aware of, have absolute awareness is I have to show up very honest, very true, very authentic, very vulnerable in and of who I am. I'm not trying to hide anything because that's what's going to create kind of a canvas for them to step into and for us to start to paint together. And so uh, what I mean by encouraging them is as I start to see um, – and I think it's just been a practice now where I can start to really, and I think like you said earlier, you can tell when people are being fake, right? I am looking for where I can tell energetically that people are not being true to themselves. And as I see them step into those places, that's where I'm encouraging. That's where I'm leaning in. That's what I'm saying. Yes, right there. That is so good. And I'm continuing to give them direction amidst mm -hmm. that process that we're going through mm -hmm. um, to get there. And so uh, it's like you said, it is a mix of both. There's like some direction and some encouragement and the direction is just meant to not give them a set of rules to follow, but a, a set of rules to understand so that they know how to break the rules and make it their own. Um, and as they go through that, that's when I'm leaning in and, and really just being present with who they are and trying to, um, just be genuine in that process, trying to really speak to the things that I can see coming out of them um, and how much they're trusting themselves in the process, how much courage they are stepping into to, um, to open up in these ways, how um, honest I can tell that they're being in their movements or how they're touching one another or how grateful I am for the fact that, that they would trust me to come into this very sacred space with them to create that. Those are some of the language that I'm sure I've used at some point um, to sure. kind of encourage them in that process. But yeah, it is definitely a both end of I'm giving direction and I'm encouraging them deeper into who they are and then continuing down that process. 
And, and on that fifth point, you say direct, don't pose, keep your clients moving rather than staying in one position, give them actions to perform until they start moving on their own. Even if they're stationary, have them continuously changing where they're touching. How do you, what does this look like? Um, and, and more specifically, what does it look like while also making sure that you don't come off like weird or creepy or like too involved? I mean, if, especially if they're enjoying this, this moment together, the last thing you want to do is going to interrupt that flow too. So what, what does that look like? Again, very practically. Yeah. So uh, one of the biggest keys I'd say is anytime that you are aiming to create images like this, asking permission is key. You can't just barge in and go, this, let me tell you what to do. Um, this is a co-creation process um, and building that trust and asking for per permission before I have them, you know, move into maybe a more intimate, more sensual type of movement or action or touching somewhere. Um, I always want to ask permission before going into that. Um, however, um, the, the constant direction, I've kind of created uh, 10 steps, um, 10 rules, if you will, that, uh, that I actually share with clients up front. Um, and then I'm referencing those throughout the shoot. Um, things such as um, having life in your hands uh, or breathing through your mouth. Um, things that at first may feel a little bit robotic because they're trying to follow the rules. But again, we're just trying to get them into a very natural flow. Uh, and it's always fascinating because this, this process that I've, I've been able to kind of craft for myself over the years, and I've taught it at workshops multiple times, it's so fascinating where when we first start, especially in a workshop, it's, it's crazy because there's a lot of people around me and whatnot, and they see a couple being pretty robotic. Um, and then all of a sudden, about 30, 40, 40 minutes into the shoot, into giving them actions of, of uh, you know, move your hand from her wrist up to her shoulder, across to her chest and back. Like something as simple as that is just getting them, again, creating safety for them to know it's okay to touch wherever you want. Um, and in that, when they start to break those rules, they start to do what I'm asking them to do on their own. That's when the, really the magic comes because at that point I have to do minimal direction. Yeah. And that's where for me, I mean, lighting is so, so big for me in my work. Like that's something that I, I value deeply. Um, but I've learned that I have to get my client to where I want them to be emotionally um, uh, so that I can really dial in and focus on lighting and those sorts of things. When I'm trying to think of lighting and background and emotion and pose and the technique I'm using with my camera and all these things, um, it's very, it's overwhelming to think about all of those things at the same time. Um, and so uh, I talk about this in the book. It's not about where you start. It's really where you end up. Um, and what I mean by that is that the first 30, 40 minutes for me is, is most of the time, although I know I'll get great images from that time, it's sort of a wash because we're going through training at that point. We're going through what it is that we're really here to do, how yeah. it is that we're really trying to show up. And once we sense. start showing up that way, it's magic the rest of the time. And that's yeah. right when golden hour comes and all of a sudden it's just like, this is crazy. <laughs> well, and speaking of, I have to jump over to this post. This is from February 13th, actually, of, of uh, 2020. So last year, I was just scrolling through and this one kind of stood out to me. But um, the session that you did of a couple near the Golden Gate, and you talk about light. I mean, the, just the subtlety of this light is is really, really great. Um, but when you talk about the idea of intimate interaction, where you I mean, you just kind of feel something. You feel the connection between the couple looking at these images. There's a lot of fun represented as well. It's not, it doesn't all have to be serious. Um, but then, I mean, this portrait, I I would love this portrait of, of me and my girlfriend, like the, the, the intimacy represented there. And yet it's such a classic look and feel uh, yeah. to the portrait of a couple. Again, a little bit of laughter, kind of mixing in the fun. This image seems extremely intimate yet again. And, and all they're doing is just, you know, nose to nose, faces close together, that the light of the city in the background. Um, but the way that you have guided them in that shoot, it just it, you get the sense that there is a very intimate interaction going on there. And, and I think it's, it's just beautifully done. Same thing for this this last shot here. Uh, again, beautiful, soft light, really beautifully done with the light. But the, the way that they're interacting there, it doesn't just feel like they're taking a picture in front of a camera. It feels like you happen to be photographing this couple who's genuinely into each other. And, uh, and it turns out that you also have a beautiful background and, and the, you know, the light's great, but it's, it's a beautiful representation of what it is that you're talking about. And, and uh, again, major props to you, Robert, for your work. And also just like major thanks for coming on the show today. I know we kind of went over a little bit in time. I, I really appreciate you making time to, yeah. to share with myself and with all of our listeners as well. 
Um, and it, just as we get ready to go here, we talked about the education piece a little bit, robertjhill.com. We go to education there. You mentioned kind of doing some coaching with photographers. Can you just give us a little information about that? Yeah, yeah. So that's primarily what I do now. Um, I only do a couple of shoots a year now. Um, uh, uh, however, I do business coaching full time. And so um, I'm, you know, delivering content online via Instagram. I have a Facebook group. Um, some, some really fun changes are about to come to the Facebook group. But if you go to work less, make more, um, you'll find the Facebook group. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I find it to be fascinating. One of the things that I think is was one of the biggest life changes of my life was was realizing that I could start a business and that I could really make anything that I wanted to see happen happen. Um, and so it's so such a privilege now to work with people and to um, not just work on here's the technical how to business things, but really to get to know people, to build relationships with people, and to really um, pull out who they are. I'm a big believer that 90% of our business problems are just personal problems that affect our business, and so. Um, uh, it's kind of a both and there's some life stuff in there. There's some personal stuff in there. There's some business stuff in there. Um, but helping people get to where it is that they want to be in their business is beyond me, uh, in terms of what I thought I'd actually be doing with my life. So that's cool, man. Well, we're going to, we're going to link to all of this in the show notes, bocapodcast.com for everybody listening in. Thank you everybody for streaming with us, for jumping in, commenting, asking questions, joining the conversation. And thanks once again, Robert, for doing this for all of us. Yeah, man. Thanks.